You think you're like Franklin Saint, Tony Montana, or Thanos, but really, you're just going to bed at 6 p.m. every Friday night. <laughs> Me, a monster? No, I am the House of Congress! <laughs> There's this very interesting saying that lays the framework for the basis of this video. When faced with the realization of who we are, we either embrace or imitate, never an in-between. The former, setting aside any moral or ethical implications, seek truth and authority within their agency. The latter seek acceptance from anyone that isn't them. This is such an inspiring quote that I made up because it helps build my case towards this aspect of one's personal identity. I believe all of us, at least to a marginal degree, exist as a concept. No, I don't mean some immaterial substance that's without form, but as some sort of either self or outwardly imposed manifestation of something. The personification of disciplines some would attribute to Bruce Lee, the epitome of intelligence would spark the image of Albert Einstein, the essence of God and beauty would inspire people to think of me, word image association in a sense. So let's play a game real quick. I'll say words and you put in the comments the first person who is fictional that comes to mind. Charismatic. Intelligent. Manipulative. Honorable. Inspiring. Strong. Now, regardless of who came to mind, you typically have an idea of who represents which words to you. This association is linked to a subconscious bias that favors characters that embody these words. A bias built up from years of personal experience. This is to say you have a repository of information and references from where you draw these figures from and they illustrate the way you kind of see the world, the people in it, and your place in it. But I think it's very fascinating when we have this pre-existing observation of how we see our reality and then the fictitious reality in which we are drawn to. A clinically sane person would never wake up one day and go, I'm going to unalive a bunch of people, and then proceed to commit mass murder. Your conscience wouldn't allow it, nor are you a government official, so there's no way you're getting away with it. Unless you're white. But when you jump on GTA, you have no qualms in uh, reverse oxygizing people. Why is that? There are two perspectives I'd like to draw from. A philosophical one, and a psychological one. In Poetics, a work by Aristotle, he mentions the idea of catharsis. He brings about the idea of purgation, like the purging of emotions in a sense. The interpretation here is that we use art as an output of sorts, a method of dealing with these emotions typically orbiting around fear or tragedy in this case, but in a much more passive way in which pleasure is the end result of it, as opposed to a much more irrational or harmful way of dealing with these emotions. So think of it like going to the gym to work out a lot of pent up rage. In psychology, we often imitate certain behaviors in these artificial outlets, and through these outlets, we learn and adopt said behaviors. According to Arthur Bandura's social cognitive theory, observation and modeling of behaviors are learned through social contexts and environments. So as opposed to just learning about certain concepts and judgments, they look to have their influence through these mediums reflected in their lives. In a case relevant to my point, video games, TV shows, and movies. So when I think of that philosophy of purging emotions and the psychology of learned behaviors, it got me thinking. Why are so many people drawn to those with villainous or antagonistic behaviors they see in fiction, and furthermore, why do we try to adopt them? Well, first things first, we don't try to adopt the personalities of losers, do we? Those that imitate shy away from who they see in the mirror, retreat into the persona they emulate first and try to materialize second. We want to identify with those that maintain a personality we aspire to incorporate. Let's take one of the most famous and influential characters that embody the lawful evil trope in fiction. If anything in this life is certain, if history's taught us anything, it says you can kill anyone. Michael Corleone, the Godfather. When we first see him, he's this relatively innocent man who wants nothing to do with the family business, but would eventually find his way deep in the criminal underworld. Michael is this sharply dressed, intelligent, cold, and calculating man. He leaves no stone unturned and no bodies unmarked. He will lie, cheat, and murder his way to succession. By the end of the first film, he is completely metamorphosed into this godfather figure. And by the end of the second film, he is, as we all now see him, to be this vicious and duplicitous man his father never wanted him to be. There is no good in what he does, and by our ways of living and thinking, we should not find any inspiration in who he is. But we do. The way Michael Corleone commands respect echoes how much charisma and power he strikes into the audience, and in turn, how much we want to mimic that. 
but only the parts that would be pragmatic to our way of living. We selectively choose what we want to be influenced by so that it does not disrupt our societal morals and values we've been taught to follow. When we watch The Godfather and the Ascension of Michael, we are enthralled by such a complex and detailed narrative of a being who has no problem getting his hands dirty and knowing that we ourselves, at least a great majority of us, can never enact such behaviors to extreme degrees. We use Michael as a means to physicalize our internal desires of who we'd like to be in some respect. Through observational behaviors, we are able to learn how to be like Michael Corleone. We see how differently he communicates with Tom versus Kay. <laughs> we see how quiet he is around his enemies versus the treacherous natures of his so-called allies. We see these Machiavellian tactics played out in full effect without actually having to do them because of real-world complications that would follow. I mean, yeah, we all know the baptism scene was real cold and everything, but... I mean, you know how expensive it is to hire hitmen in this economy nowadays? One thing we should understand is that Michael is a sociopath. His exposure to the family business, the war, and his evolution transformed him into an anti-social criminal. He is far more tragic as opposed to inspiring as it feels like his path was determined for him. I won't bring free will into this, and while he had agency behind major decisions like killing Soloso McCluskey and ordering the death of Fredo, when we look at his life retrospectively, it feels like there were too many key points that built this pathway for him. That tragedy and knowing by the second movie he's this abusive and neglecting man towards anything that does not further his interests, but his justification is that it's for the succession of his family. And through that justification, when matched with the presentation of his character, we are able to understand these actions. See. If we're able to rationalize behaviors, we're more accepting of those behaviors. You see the countless videos of how to be like, how to think like Michael Corleone because he doesn't display weakness. Human flaws, yes, but he's the textbook example of the type of calculating individual most men aspire to be. Power rules everything, but knowledge controls power, and if you want to be in continuous positions of power, then you will want to be like the Godfather. Even though Michael exhibits dark displays of malice, indifference, and action, we look to isolate these traits because we believe it will amplify the desired results that we're looking for. In Bandura's paper, Social Learning Theory, he details how man's cognitive ability to foresee certain outcomes are derived from multiple learning factors, such as directed and observational experiences, modes of informative, motivational, and incentivized functions of reinforcement. People can represent external influences symbolically and later use such representations to guide their actions. They solve their problems symbolically without having to enact the various alternatives and they can foresee the probable consequences of different actions and alter their behaviors accordingly. These higher mental processes permit both insightful and foresightful behavior. Let's apply this to Michael. Look at how his body language is used to convey fear, respect, authority, and presence. When Michael looks at you, he is not looking at you, he is giving you the penance there. It is piercing. So subtle yet powerful and it seizes control over his opponents without them even knowing it. The results of these functions lead to, what we see, a desired result of the aforementioned actions. Him staying seated when Mo Green shakes his hand to showcase the total lack of respect he has for him whilst preventing Mo from having any sort of control in the room. This is further exemplified when he sits with his back turned towards Mo and his own casino. Michael pulling up a chair next to Carl to give him a false sense of reassurance and understanding with the purpose of him lowering his guard and then having him executed. Where I believe this differs from when heroes conduct themselves in similar manners is, well, we don't respect the authority of the fictional hero the same as we do a villain because we don't have to live vicariously through the lives of heroes because we're heroes every day. Aww. But we don't want to be, at least not in the context I'm describing. We like the dark, gritty, by any means necessary type of characters because, more often than not, that's not who we are, but we enjoy watching a sandbox of these people that can live like that. Michael's actions are rewarded with respect, but it is done so in a manner which is so attractive and alluring. Two other components I will mention with another example shortly. From the slick back hair, fancy suits, and how he looks smoking with cigarettes, he amalgamates all the qualities and characteristics that would not fit the standard hero archetype but one befitting of a villain and anti-hero. Due to our standard of what is morally right and just, the prevalence of where we see these traits, we seek out to identify and match the thinking of someone like Michael because he, for lack of a better term, does not give a fuck. And when you're constantly around people that do, you'd rather be the person that doesn't because, well, it's cooler. So when we see Michael project an aura of grandiose and gravitas, it is never without reward. Something is gained from it. And through the observation, that repetition, we look to emulate that in ways which will benefit us in the real world. You know, <laughs> I'm beginning to see the correlation as to why those red pill losers act how they act because of this. 
why they love to say stuff like, man, no one has the balls to say this, but I will. Yeah, all right, Kozo. On that note of not wanting to be like losers, the proof is in the pudding with Michael, because we don't remember the innocent college boy, but the merciless godfather. In that light, there's someone else who people wanted to imitate more until after a certain change in character. Man, when that boy put up his hair in a ponytail, it was raps after that. He was done playing for real. Eden Yeager from the Attack on Titan series has a very intriguing character development arc. Transforming from an idealistic and pretty much a naive, brash young kid whose intention was the extermination of all the Titans to a genocidal maniac. Yes, he was a genocidal maniac. No, he was not justified. No, I do not care. Suck your mother. Eden, I dare you call me a slave. I ain't Armin. I will spin your eye. Throughout the majority of Attack on Titan's life cycle, the most popular character was Levi. Hell, he still is the most popular character. But soon after, Eden evolved into whatever this is, his stock skyrocketed because he became this complex villain, this antagonistic force of nature. He became a lot more tactical, commanding, and cold. He literally had people call themselves Jaegerists because he had created a devoted following, a religion almost. A lot more people desired to identify with him because, once again, he began to display behaviors of, and this is going to sound very weird out loud, sociopathic tendencies. His detachment towards everything outside of his mission enabled a consequentialist mindset within him, believing his actions were for the betterment of mankind and he was willing to sacrifice anything and everything in order to achieve that goal. When watching Eren, we are far more captivated by this new persona as opposed to his previous one where he didn't exhibit any strong qualities of a leader or someone who was more intellectually driven. In fact, we were, in mass, far more indifferent about him. Only when he adopted this new stoic identity did we pay more attention to him. In the conventional and traditional sense of gender, Eren portrays far more masculine qualities, strong, charismatic, and leadership traits, when put onto the front line cause a much more thorough and in-depth analysis that he was not this privy to beforehand. His rise in popularity speaks for itself, and as mentioned before with Michael, his behaviors reaped benefits, the building of a religion and community. Because of this, our learning function goes from an unconscious level to a conscious level of awareness. Somehow, Aaron convinced a lot of y'all genocide was the way forward. And that's the fascination of it. That charisma, that gritty nature. We become attached to the point where people will argue in favor of Aaron despite knowing he was completely insane and had lost his mind. Eggman shows up every single damn Sonic game talking about world control and domination and not one person wants to be like Eggman. I mean look at him. But Aaron has both the appearance and this justification that people can rationalize and therefore can become attracted to and convinced by him. It's very similar to Metarum from Hunter x Hunter who at first believed in strictly creating a hegemony of chimera ants who rule the earth but would soon have his ambitions morphed by the influence of Komugi and Netaro. How he intellectualizes his motivations has us almost siding with him. Hell, Netaro even stated that if you listen to him talk for much longer, he may have been swayed by him. In the case of Eren's behavioral patterns, those masculine qualities shine through far more apparently as opposed to his former angsty teen identity. But let's just say, hypothetically, that there was some edgy kid in the real world who wanted to enact a dispassionate genocidal cleanse with reasons we could rationalize. Would there be people on his side? Hell no! At least not in the large scale you see people argue for error. That's because it's real and no one really wants to enact such atrocities. At least I hope not. We only and specifically draw from elements that will have an actual practical and beneficial use for us individually as opposed to manifesting an entire goal and through that through observations, we see that in order to achieve this, we must be, or at the very least, pretend to be that. The idolatrous nature of these villains do not dispel the iconic and admirable features of their adversaries. Superman, Spider-Man, Ichigo, Luffy, Gon, okay maybe not Gon, Mike Ross, Goku, 
These are characters that showcase the strengths of goodness, kindness, and in their way, justice. However, the dissection of them, the aspiration and desire to be like them, aren't typically as prevalent as the desires to be like, or at the very least think like, their opponents. Even when you have shows like Power, where the crime boss in Ghost is a literal villain and an awful human being within the story who sells drugs, mercilessly kills people, and a multitude of other illegal dealings, we never really look at it that way. We hardly root for the failures of Ghost as it's far more pleasing to see him succeed over the police and his enemies. I couldn't wait for this beanbag to get smoked. Naturally, because he is our protagonist and we often want to root for our protagonist, but even if said protagonist is everything we would not want to have running amok in the streets in real life, we remain captivated by their presence, character, and mindset. Light Yagami is another example, but interestingly enough, the case with Light is far more polarizing because of his antagonist in L, who pretty much matched him in every way imaginable and has a similar, if not higher, popularity rank than Light. Light had a very twisted sense of justice, but he was not afraid to go through the most evil ways to achieve his goals. Whereas L harbored more deontological ethics, but because of its intellect, presentation, and visual appeal, we don't see it the same way we look at the authority in stories like Power, American Gangster, or The Wolf of Wall Street. They do not represent traits we want to adopt to the same degree people like L do, and that's probably because L and Light are two sides of the same coin. While it could be argued that Light is a psychopath and L is someone who harbors asocial, not antisocial, there's a difference, asocial tendencies which grant him a mystifying aura, and because of that we are far more drawn to this character. So while the good guys in these worlds are the people we should aspire to be like, they represent, for lack of a better term, the goody two-shoes identity too strongly for us to feel any type of difference. In fact, I'd argue while we can relate to that way of thinking, we don't want to. Fiction is a place to escape real life, immerse ourselves in the fantasy of the what ifs, where we can openly like and praise the bad guys without remorse where we can see if we can draw similarities between us and them and then seek to imitate certain characteristics, where we can see just how much of a villain lies in them and how much a villain lies in us and how we can justify it. At the end of the day, everyone loves a good villain. We all like to see the good guys fail from time to time because it breaks from the standard. Due to our conditions to follow the straight line in life, taking rebellious detours through these characters is our purgation, and then to pick up certain behaviors from these characters is another way to take a safe peek into the side of life we are not supposed to aspire towards. What if I was as cold as Michael Corleone? What if I gave into the absurdist realities that corrupted Eren Yeager? What if I put makeup on my face and ran through the city chasing people in costumes for a living? What if just for a day, just for a moment, I was the villain. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be different? Wouldn't that be exciting? Either way, it wraps right back around to the beginning. We either embrace who we are, or we look towards others to mimic the qualities of those we, deep down, in the depths of our psyche, aspire to be like to some level. But when you ask yourself that question, always remember, it's good to do good. It's good to be in the path of righteousness, no matter what the character you see illustrates otherwise. No matter what, if you are to imitate anybody, imitate those that represent good, strong, moral, ethical, humane values. <laughs>the sources I use for my research will be linked in the description below so you guys can go ahead and understand the secret to my sauce, you know, and just learn a little something new. I like putting you guys on to new shit for real. My next video is going to be about the disgusting, evil, and even more villainous world of online dating, but it's not going to be the way y'all think it's going to be, so be on the lookout for that one. It's going to be a little bit interesting.
by the way i got a twitter account now so go ahead and follow me over there to stay updated with what i got going on i like interacting with you guys that's half the joy of this youtube stuff matter of fact you know what a lot of people leave before the end of the video and they could be missing out on something mad important so for those that stick around to the end let's start something fun let's start what i'm gonna call a redux reference which means in the comments of the next video reference what was said at the end of the previous video i.e this one and then put it on to the next one so in the comments of the next video of my future video right with no context no explanation in the comments tell everyone what your favorite color is don't explain nothing don't give away any clues just say my favorite color is and then make it unrelated to whatever you got to say afterwards stop messing with them <laughs> let's go see what happens with that thanks again for watching but until next time back to the shadows i go i'm out of here